My name is Vas Vasiliadis. Um, I've got lots of affiliations listed up there. Um, mostly I'm with the University of Chicago, um, where I wear a couple of hats. I do teach so I can uh, scratch my technical itch, but mostly um, I work on a project called Globus. Um, and for those that, that are not familiar with Globus, it's a service for um, researchers to uh, manage their data, manage their computation. Um, it's a service that we've been developing and operating at the University um, of Chicago in the Office of Research for uh, in various forms for over 25 years now, but uh, most recently in its, in its current form about 15 years. And um, we're the sort of strange group, but we're a, mis a mission-driven organization that's really out there trying to help researchers do their work better, more efficiently, um, and do so in a sustainable manner. And, you know, Dan, Dan Reed um, pointed out sustainability as, as an issue. That's something that we've sort of had um, as a requirement from day one. Um, a lot of our funding does come from federal agencies, but we've also worked on a model to uh, sort of keep things going in the absence of uh, continued federal support. Um, I just wanted to quickly go back down memory lane. So the last time I was here with this group was, it's five years ago, it was hard to believe. Um, at that time, we had just started um, helping people manage um, and work with protected data as part of their um, research uh, data environments. Um, we had, I had given people a whole bunch of timeline, but the thing I wanted to focus on here is we had about 100,000 users, which we thought was wonderful at the time. Uh, fast forward five years, um, that's grown substantially. Um, we've got over half a million right now. Um, we have a lot of institutions that are supporting us um, through our sort of hybrid uh, subscription model for sustainability. Um, and as I say in the bottom, we're getting there. It's kind of that line keeps sort of nudging up against um, the, the, to the sort of the crossover point, but uh, uh, we're, we're close to the point where the service will be sustained uh, by the help of uh, many of you in this room, in fact. Um, and uh, uh, you know, this is, this is sort of the will today. And what was our tagline back then has evolved um, as the scope of what we do has evolved. And uh, it now says research IT reimagined, which is very big and fuzzy um, and all encompassing. Um, but I wanted to focus in today's talk about um, a couple of the things that are really driving um, why we need to be reimagining research IT. So um, uh, if you were um, a teen in, the, in sort of the 80s, which, which I was, um, so that's just dating myself a little bit, but um, you know, you might have watched B movies like that, the aliens are coming. Uh, a few years ago, I started showing this slide, which is that the instruments are coming. And this is the thing that's really scaring uh, a lot of people. Um, back then, this was scary to many of the large R1s, um, but most others hadn't sort of seen this uh, monster coming around the corner. Um, I think it's here now for just about everybody. Um, so the growth of instruments is a big thing. Um, and the other thing is that we have um, a lot more and in many cases much larger collaborations um, in research. As a proxy for that, I, I use some data from our own service. Um, and this is an indication of the amount of systems that are being used to share data with um, collaborators um, across our community. Uh, and you can see that this is the number that are active in a given month. So we're approaching two and a half thousand systems out there uh, people are using to share data. So that at least is a strong indicator to me um, that collaboration continues to grow. Um, so if you combine um, the sort of growth in, in the instruments, in the sensor rates, particularly, and I'll show you a couple of slides in a second here, um, with, a com with uh, the growth in collaboration, we have this increasing need to really automate a lot of what people are doing, just because we're well beyond the point of where you can point and click your way through things. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I'd share a few examples of uh, the work that we've done with uh, various institutions uh, around helping them automate their instrument uh, data environments. Uh, on sort of the somewhat simpler end of the scale, by no means easy, um, is the typical next-gen sequencing genomics course. The University of Michigan has been a long-time supporter of ours. Um, they sequence you know, thousands of samples um, every year from, from many different groups. Um, and there are a number of steps that these samples go through, um, all the way ultimately to data being shared with um, some larger group, perhaps even beyond the project boundaries. So, um, this is kind of a, a recurring pattern that we see of um, data having to be moved from instruments 
going through some initial analysis, then perhaps going through further analysis downstream, and very importantly at the end, they're being um, shared more broadly. Um, in some cases, um, these data sets um, are public, and um, obviously that uh, is, is a, a responsibility that, that a lot more researchers have nowadays with uh, federal funding mandates. Um, uh, and the other point is that it tends to touch a lot of systems, so the infrastructure required here can actually be quite complex, and it's really something that researchers shouldn't have to concern th themselves with, and that's, that's really where we've um, done a lot of work to help people um, with that. Uh, so next-gen sequencing is one, ex and actually, the, uh, I, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar here with, with sequencing and the nanopore technology, um, but if you look at what you can get, uh, the amount of data that's coming out of these um, systems nowadays that are literally the size of what used to be desktop computers in, in, in my early days, um, you know, m multiple tens of terabytes if you run these things uh, continuously, um, it's really, really scary. Um, and the other area that, uh, the other instrument um, area that we've seen a lot more progress in is um, the cryo-electron microscopy. Um, if you don't have one of these on your campus, I believe you will. Um, it's just a matter of time. Um, and once you see, I mean, it's a, it's a cool looking thing. It's all closed up because it's very low temperature and doing interesting things. But the, this slide, when I first saw this data, it kind of blew me away and it's already five, five years old. Um, so down there is the, every, the resolution, the highest resolution of one of these instruments, two angstroms approximately which um, I'm told is about twice the width of a hydrogen atom. So these things can see detail in the samples um, at essentially anatomic resolution. And again, Dan pointed out some of this in the, in the earlier talk. So um, that's pretty scary, right? There's a lot of data. Um, and this is um, the, uh, the, the flow that's kind of typical. So again, you're getting data off of these instruments um, and manipulating it, having a human manipulate the images is, you know, works at um, a small scale, but when you have, you know, these instruments are very expensive shared devices and you want them to be fully utilized, so you want, you know, this experiment to be done as quickly as possible, get the next one lined up and get, you know, sort of get that throughput um, as, as high as possible. Um, so you, you definitely do need some level of automation. Um, and this is another case of where it's a little different in the next-gen sequencing, perhaps, because you have um, a human in the loop a lot of the time. So that's another aspect to automation that's a little challenging. Um, sometimes it's easy to automate something from end to end when it's kind of a lights out thing. You press the button and it just goes. Um, it's a little different when you have humans sort of sticking their fingers in the pie um, and having the, the sort of the, the downstream analysis take different paths. So that's an area where we've... Um, worked really hard to understand um, um, what the needs are. Um, and again, trying to get to the point where the automation um, works all the way from the point of capture of the data through to the point of publication. And, um, and I use publication in a sort of a loose sense, in, not in the sort of traditional I publish a paper sense. That can be one aspect of it, but in many cases this is still, um, you know, working data, um, but it has to be published in the sense that it has to be shared and made available to, uh, to others, um, sometimes just within the lab, within the project, within a collaboration, the broader community, and so on at different scales. Um, so one, um, one example of where um, we've been working on this is with um, the Rosalind Franklin Institute. Um, I have a video there which probably won't work, but um, they are investing, um, this is a group in the UK at Harwell um, that are investing in a lot of um, very advanced instrumentation, particularly around cryo-electron microscopy, and they, um, they are publishing um, they're taking data all the way from the instrument through to, again, publication level. Um, and a very big part of that is, beyond sort of the initial analysis, is figuring out how are they going to store it, who are they going to share it with, and more importantly, how are they going to describe it so that it can be discovered um, and, and reused down the road. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the third example I wanted to talk about was... Um, this is uh, another collaboration that we've been part of for many years. Uh, so there's a facility at, at Argonne National Lab called the Advanced Photon Source. Um, it's a synchrotron, and um, 
uh, it has many beam lines that are used to shine very bright x-rays through different samples and do various types of science. One of those mechanisms, one of those methods is serial crystallography, which um, I am by no means an expert. In fact, I know very little about it, but I do know that um, this is a technique that's used in one instance to try and um, discover the structure of proteins. And this is something that um, was very much at the forefront of the um, early COVID research. Uh, so we were fortunate to work with um, with uh, a number of groups. Um, this was a multi-institutional collaboration where we um, took data from these beam lines um, and put it through various transformations um, as far as um, getting sort of initial quality check on the data, then analyzing it, then doing the image rendering, um, and then extracting um, facets and metadata from the image such that it could be published actually in a, um, a data portal that was then um, made available to um, everybody else that was working on, on these projects. And in many instances, these were um, uh, large open science collaborations where these portals, the data in these portals was immediately available worldwide and was used worldwide by others um, who were supporting those, um, those early um, efforts in um, uh, drug discovery. So, um, so this, there's a lot has been written about this particular one. If you care, I have um, some, some references here. I should probably put the DOI, shame on me. Um, so, uh, but the key point is at the bottom there, uh, 10 to 100 times speed up in time of the solution of protein structures um, at the advanced photon source. And um, again, I'm, I'm not a, um, a life sciences or a drug discovery person, but I do know that this aspect um, of sort of figuring out protein structures is, is critical to a lot of the early stage of any um, um, uh, th uh, therapeutics and, and, and drug development. So uh, being able to have that kind of impact, I think, is, is uh, quite significant. And this really was, by and large, as a result of the, uh, the ability to automate um, these processes end-to-end, -end because as I said, they touch many, many different systems um, and many different people, uh, and it's not something that you could very easily orchestrate um, in sort of a, a, a manual sense. So um, how did we, as a, as a service provider, as, as, as a Globus, um, fit into this picture? Uh, so. Uh, the, the, the systems that, that I work on, we have multiple different services to enable some of these kinds of um, capabilities. Uh, the, the one that I want to, so I want to sort of talk about them working from the point of publication back, because this to me again is, is probably the most important, is to make sure um, that the data is out there and discoverable. So uh, one of the services that, that, we, that we give researchers is called Globus Search. Uh, not very um, original, I guess, but um, hopefully it conveys what it does. Uh, key point is that um, we allow the researcher to describe the data in whatever way makes sense to them. So we are um, agnostic about the type of schema that's used. Um, and we make it really easy to query these indexes um, just using simple URL queries. Uh, the, um, and the other part of it is we have um, interfaces to data sites so you can mint DOIs. Um, and you know, ideally you have uh, DOIs associated with every single subject in your index. Um, uh, an important part of this also is um, uh, the ability to share the data beyond, as I said, sort of the immediate group. Um, and with sharing, uh, we have the ability for um, anybody to, in an ad hoc manner to say, you know, share this directory with you know, someone in my lab. Um, but it's becoming more and more important to have um, much more fine-grained control and different policies in place um, around data sharing. So um, as part of um, the Globus search service, we've got this ability to define uh, or to allow the researcher to specify not only who can um, share and see the data, but also who can share and see the metadata. Um, so it can be all the way open, and it is in many cases that's appropriate, but in more and more cases where we're seeing, especially in the life sciences, because there are protected data involved, we're seeing the need to have that more, so sort of that bifurcated model where some things are available to all, whereas others um, have additional restrictions imposed on them. So um, that's another aspect that we've had to deal with, and um, 
So again, as I said, five years ago, I was here, and this was sort of the big thing for us um, to support and um, protect the data management. Uh, of course, is, if you're in this space at all, you know that the, the list of compliance uh, vectors here keeps growing on the left. Um, we're doing our best to keep up, but um, we are seeing m many, many uh, more of the institutions that we work with uh, blending together um, protected CUI type data with open data and, and, and using ideally a, a, um, the same platform to, uh, to enable researchers to work with those data. Um, and this is really sort of our, our mission um, in talking to those folks is saying that you don't normally, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, if, if, I, if I go back to early conversations we had, especially with some large hospital systems that, that, uh, that, that we've worked with, uh, the answer was just no. Um, you know, you go to legal and it's no. Um, sharing means it's all open, no. Um, and in fact, we've tried to sort of work with them to, to help them educate um, the, the stakeholders to understand that you don't have to make the trade-off. You can be compliant and, and you can collaborate within those uh, compliance frameworks as well. Um, the, um, the other area where we've uh, been really, really active is as we've seen the evolution of um, uh, systems, storage systems, particularly going from mostly service um, systems on um, on premise, on campus, at the institution, out uh, to the cloud, um, we have had to to support those. And as this um, uh, diversity grows in these types of storage systems, it's becoming incumbent on the researcher to figure out how to use all of them. And we've tried to really make it easy for them by providing um, a, a unified interface so that they, when they're looking at their laptop, um, data on their laptop, or they're looking at data on one of the large cloud providers or anything else, um, it all just looks the same. Um, and, and that's been really, really important to sort of um, making the rest of this infrastructure um, accessible to them. Um, and. Uh, in some of those um, previous slides, I showed um, a couple of computation steps. This is a relatively recent thing that we've that we've been uh, um, uh, working with folks on. Um, it's essentially the ability to um, run code um, on a compute resource that you have access to, irrespective of where it is, and do it in a consistent, unified way, just as if you were running the code on your laptop. So. Um, uh, without getting too technical, if anyone's familiar with the term function as a service, um, this is essentially what we're doing, but we're allowing uh, the researcher to run it all the way from a laptop up to a supercomputer, and it's really just by doing the exact same thing. It's just that um, the, the platform will take care of um, uh, putting it out there. Um, and then sort of bringing it all the way back to the automation point, um, we, there's a service called Globus Flows that provides um, this reliable orchestration that I was showing, those sort of looped uh, flows. Um, so the researcher can decide you know, what the series of actions is that they need to take on, on the data, on the analysis and so on. Um, they can sort of codify it in one of these flows and then, uh, if you will, outsource it to um, the Globus platform to actually manage that repeatedly um, at, at scale. Um, and what's been really interesting actually over the past probably two years is we've seen, so a lot of these services, uh, we've helped people build um, uh, sort of end-to-end -end solutions, but we're starting to see more and more people building their own. So they're accessing these services directly um, and integrating them. Um, together with some of the portal frameworks that, that we have out there. They've, this is just a, a, a sampling of some of the, um, uh, the, the data repositories and portals that are out there where the, so the two defining characteristics of these kinds of services are that uh, they serve a lot of large data sets. Um, which are very, very difficult to handle if you're just using some of the repositories where you have to, you know, where you're limited to downloading from your browser. Um, we work, for instance, with a lot of climate data. I think I've got, uh, so the NCAR, the Research Data Archive uh, at NCAR is one such example. Uh, some of the smallest data sets are terabyte size, um, and there are many larger ones. That's not something that you can handle through through a browser. So we've started to see more and more folks um, adopting these services in their own environments and building um, these more bespoke solutions. Uh, and that's actually also reflected in some of the data. So this is 
the number of applications that have been registered um, with us that then use some of these services. So we're approaching the 10,000 mark, which I think is actually pretty cool um, for as far as the community um, adoption goes. Um, the, the other key thing um, that we focused on is in terms of, so I had FAIR in my talk, in my title, and that wasn't just uh, clickbait. Besides, I was competing with two other AI talks. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, but um, hopefully you, you've, you've heard me say things like accessible and findable, et cetera. Um, and that's really ultimately what we're all about is that through um, automating these processes and using these services, the data are by default fair. When they come out the other end, if you will, whatever that end looks like, um, they're there, they can be found, they can be reused, they can be moved to other places very easily. So they're really accessible. And one of the ways in which we do that is that we allow uh, a lot of institutions, a lot of researchers to log in with their existing um, institutional credentials. So we've, we've um, since day one, actually, we've been uh, working with Internet2, with the InCommon Federation, and and, um, uh, and, and through EduGain and other um, federations like that. Um, so anybody that's part of those uh, federations already has access to these capabilities, uh, and we continue to, to expand on that. Uh, so I know I've got just maybe a couple minutes here, and I want to leave time for questions. So uh, I want to talk just briefly about what... Um, uh, what we're doing now, sort of what the next wave looks like. So beyond just automating the capture to publication, obviously we're seeing AI and other things coming into the, into the fold. Um, so we're starting to see things like this, you know, this, the, this idea of smart instruments. Um, this is an example of a collaboration between, on the left is um, Slack, um, just a few hundred miles up the road here, uh, and Argonne, a few miles from, from where I live. Um, and uh, again, it's one of these experiments where uh, the sample is being um, hit by a beam line, some data, some analysis is being done um, sort of at the point of capture, and then um, the data is sent over to Argon, which takes a few seconds, um, and then another model is run, uh, another AI model is run at Argon, and then the results of that sort of optimized, more in a finely tuned model um, is sent back to um, Slack. So roughly every 30 seconds you have this experiment being self-tuned and sort of, or not self-tuned, but, but being incrementally improved and tuned. Um, so this, this, this kind of sort of smart um, uh, experimentation is something we're starting to see a lot more of. Um, Ian Foster, who leads our, our group, um, he's heavily involved in these things called self-driving labs where even the physical infrastructure that's controlling the experiment is actually um, sort of uh, modified and, and controlled by um, these automated processes with some um, intelligence and machine learning built into them. Uh, so I will, um, I will leave it there. So we have about five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, that was quite, quite a big sweep you gave us in a short period of time. Um, could you talk about how you can relate these, the, the data sets, to other parts of the infrastructure? I'm thinking for the way astronomy works, where the data that's going into the astronomy archives then relates to publications in ADS and metadata and Strasbourg and so on and to that at Caltech. Is there anything like that out of Globus yet? So, I will say as a, as a general approach, we're not uh, we're not involved directly in those discipline specific. Um, so the examples that I showed were things that we helped with. We were part of those projects. In some cases, we we did some of the development ourselves. But really, it's up to those collaborations and those folks to to build those solutions. So in in a in, in sort of a negative way, we're, we're the plumbing that, um, that allows things to flow, um, and we should probably not be seen or even know, people shouldn't even know that we exist in some ways. Um, so I, that's, that's the role, that's sort of the, the, the philosophy, if you will, behind it. Um, but yeah, it, it's really, if you have that, that environment, which is actually very common, not just in astronomy and many other disciplines, um, it, it is incumbent on, on the institutions as well to, to invest in pulling some of these pieces together into a, a solution, yeah. <clears throat>
Yes. I know you talked about how, how large a data set you can run through this. Is there a, a size small enough that your solution is overkill? Uh, I don't know that. So um, Dan put the slide up there with big, uncomfortably big data. Is there an uncomfortably small data set? I don't know. Um, generally, when you're dealing with lots of small files that present all sorts of problems, not just in our infrastructure, just in storage systems, in compute systems. So uh, it, it's a judgment call. I mean, does the system perform optimally at those extremes? Probably not, but then most other systems that we connect don't either. So yeah, there's, there's probably a sweet spot. But we see people all the time. We have one example right now. I'm actually, um, we were talking to some of the folks um, that have sensors out on ships in the ocean um, where they're gathering you know, thousands of readings, but everyone is a little file with the reading of something. Um, and they have to bring all this together and they have to transfer it to shore where it can actually be processed on real machines and so on. Um, so we're, we're working with those kinds of, of systems. And there are ways that you can uh, optimize those, those processes. Yeah. Yes. So I have three questions. Can we go one at a time? Sure. <laughs> so one actually builds on what you just asked. You show the connection to long-term archives. Yeah. When you're depositing into those, are you packaging like small data files? And what That's a great question. Yeah. Um, we get asked that a lot. So we have, there is a, a, a way for you to specify that you should sort of archive, sort of tar the files, if you will, and then push them out. Uh, but again, that's something we leave up to the, the user or the institution or the, the research computing administrators to, to put policy around because those systems are, you know, depending on how they're being managed, you can do lots of weird things and, and break them and make it very, make a lot of people very unhappy. So, yeah, but we do have that, the ability to do that, yeah. Uh, what I said was that you can have differentiated policies to control access to the metadata and the data. Um, so an example, so we, we, we worked on a, um, uh, on a federated set of uh, a cancer, regist cancer data registries um, with the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, so there you could see, for instance, in the search, you could see cohort level data, but you couldn't see anything more specific in the metadata, right? And then as far as the data, then you had to sometimes go through an IRB or other th mechanisms to get access to the actual data. So point is that you, you, you can have that separation because sometimes it's sort of a, an all or nothing, right? I either see everything and therefore I have to really control who can get to it or I see nothing and then it doesn't really help with collaboration. So we try and, and sort of uh, break that apart a little bit. Okay, so the last thing I think relates to that. You talked about the authentication mechanisms you have, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so we have, uh, so we, we on the authentication side, we just act as a broker. So you can show up and log in with your whatever credentials. Um, the authorization is controlled by um, whoever owns or controls that system. So, uh, if you are the owner and manager of that storage, you decide who has access to it. We give you mechanisms within uh, the Globus service to reflect those policies um, in the in the installation that you put on campus. Um, and, we inf and we enforce them, but it's really up to you to define those. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Um, two, two, one comment, one question. Yes. Uh, the comments being, uh, it's great to see that, that you're starting to focus on a large science instrumentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, n n no, uh, that's actually not, not the case. So um, we have this hybrid model, so I'll talk to the subscription just briefly. Um, 
the uh, the core services for moving data between systems are available to any any nonprofit researcher. There's no cost for that. Um, if you want to access some and 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 many of these other features also have limited access. So, for instance, if you want to have a search index, you can have one, but without a subscription, you can only have one. So, if you want to scale this out, we do ask people to subscribe, but you can actually use a lot of these capabilities without having um, a subscription. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. No, I, I I agree, and 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 that number that you saw of of the number of of active users. So, um, I think we're at last count at well over two thousand institutions actively used on a daily basis. Of those, a little over ten percent are subscribers. Oh, okay. So that's their end, and we also have, for instance, um, many. Um, uh, partnerships between, let's say, a pharmaceutical company and um, a university where um, the commercial partner needs access to the data, um, the university can make it available to them, there's no cost. I mean, they, we have lots and lots of these scenarios. So if you have a specific case, I'd be more than happy to chat with you afterwards. Right, yeah. You. yeah. Yes. Ah, yes, the eternal question. Um, and again, Dan, of course, uh, stole the thunder there. Um, we don't have any mechanisms for doing that because, again, it's your data or it's whoever's data, um, and you have to make sure that that DOI resolves to something that still exists over time. We, Because we don't own or in any way control the storage um, or what happens to the data when it moves between storage systems, right? I mean, we know that it's moved, but it's still between your own systems. So we just don't have a way of, 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 of ensuring that, unfortunately. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'll be around the rest of the conference. Happy to check. <laughs> <laughs>